knows too much. The most important witness to the JFK assassination never made an appearance in the Warren Commission report. But why would that surprise anyone? Ed Hoffman was easily dismissed at the scene because he was a deaf mute who couldn't communicate what he'd witnessed. Hoffman happened to be seated on the triple overpass near Daly Plaza on November 22, 1963. Hoffman did tell his uncle, who was a Dallas policeman, as well as his father. The story alarmed his father, who encouraged his son to keep quiet. His uncle filed no report. During the summer of 1967, however, five years after the fact, Hoffman went to the FBI and over a few weeks met at least twice with agents who filed reports. These reports were designed to minimize the information and cast doubt on Hoffman's story. Six years later, Hoffman wrote a letter to Edward Kennedy, who also dismissed his story. In March of 1977, Hoffman returned to the FBI once again. What Hoffman saw was a puff of gun smoke from the picket fence, which he mistook for someone lighting a cigarette. The man wore a stylish black hat and dark blue suit. He turned and tossed a rifle to another man wearing the uniform of a railroad worker. The railroad worker twisted the gun, breaking it in two, and deposited it into a toolbox before casually walking towards the railroad tracks. In the pandemonium that followed, Hoffman had tried vainly to communicate with the first policeman on the scene and quickly lost sight of the two men. However, despite pressure from his family, who seemed to have realized how dangerous this info was, Hoffman refused to bury the story and kept trying to force it into the open. You can watch his testimony. He gave it to a British film crew. Hoffman is one of the most credible witnesses to the event. A list that also includes Richard Carr, Buell Fraser, James Tague, Lee Bowers, S.M. Holland, and Amos Enos, among others. If you spend enough time sifting through the evidence of this case, eventually the pieces will fall into place, and Hoffman's testimony is supported by numerous other crucial pieces of evidence. JFK's murder had been in the works for months, and at least two previous attempts had been aborted due to leakage. The first attempt had been planned for Chicago and was aborted when an FBI informant known as Lee dropped a dime to the Chicago Secret Service. The second attempt was scheduled for Miami and was aborted after an FBI informant wearing a wire picked up a right-wing extremist talking about the impending hit. That extremist was Joe Miltier, and among other details, he noted that the shots would come from a tall building, the rifle would be broken down, and a patsy would be immediately picked up to close down any investigation. The weapon used to murder JFK was the same one Miltier had likely been made aware of since Miltier was visiting Miami at the time he was wiretapped. And Miami is where the CIA's largest station outside Langley had recently been closed down by JFK. This station, JM Wave, is where the JFK assassination team was assembled and trained. The station had originally created this hit squad to murder Castro, but when Kennedy ordered that project shut down, the team responded by targeting JFK. The identity of the grassy knoll gunman who delivered the fatal headshot has become Excalibur as far as the media is concerned, and more smoke and mirrors have been applied to prevent extracting the sword than almost any other aspect of the complex story. But pay attention to Hoffman and realize none of the tramps fit this description. So Woody Harrelson's dad and CIA assassin Charles Rogers are off the hook. I'm convinced John Roselli was a shooter simply because Handsome Johnny was working so closely with J.M. Wave at the time and had been the first professional hitman recruited into the CIA's secret executive action program. Roselli never hid his involvement. As a result, he was railroaded into jail and wound up in pieces floating in a barrel in Biscayne Bay after being released. But Roselli claimed he had been hiding inside the triple overpass inside a storm drain and had fired the first shot, which hit JFK in the throat, not the kill shot from the knoll. Over the decades, the name Lucien Sarti, a Corsian hitman and drug runner, has popped up over and over. Like Roselli, Sarti appears to have been a dapper dresser and might fit Hoffman's description of the shooter. 
Sardi was killed by Mexican police in Mexico City in April 1972, reportedly the result of a collaborative effort by the men of honor working with the intelligence agencies in order to shatter Corsican influence in the worldwide narcotics traffic and replace it with one dominated by Florida crime boss Santos Traficante. But perhaps the most interesting detail of this story could be the fact that if you check out the people along the parade route near Daly Plaza, you'll find Joseph Miltier watching as Kennedy rides into the ambush. (laughs) 